the process is affected by temperature and moisture as well. This is Arizona honeysuckle, another hummingbird flower. Observing dates when natural phenomena such as blooming occur is called phenology, phenomena, phenology. Englishman Gilbert White was among the first to put his observations into print, and so he's considered the father of phenology. Here's the curious naturalist smoke poking at a snake. Of course, White wasn't the first to study phenology. Traditional farmers have always relied on the natural calendar to plant and to harvest. Local people do the same thing. Hopi farmers still do this. Their observation of solar dates are for the ceremonial, not the planting aspect of farming. Planting depends on seasonal cues, including the blooming of wildflowers. We notice that a number of June bloomers like a bit of afternoon shade, presumably because June is so warm and dry. Woods rose blooms in June, usually in partial shade. Spider milkweed seems to prefer spots that are warmer than the rose, but it likes a little shade in the afternoon, too. Seagull lilies grow from bulbs, which give them the reserves to bloom in late June when it's very dry and warm. While claret cup cactus stores a lot of moisture in its fleshy stems, enabling it to thrive in the full sun on a hot June afternoon. This is a ponderosa in mid-June. Male pollen cones and female colons form on the same tree, but usually pollen cones form on the lower branches of the tree away from the seed cones, which are up top. Sometimes they form on the same shoot. The pollen cones shed pollen between about June 10th and 20th. Conifers use wind pollination, which is less precise than relying on an insect pollinator, and so they shower us with pollen, as you may have noticed in the cone-bearing years. It takes two years for the cones to mature, and many of the seeds are consumed by birds as well as squirrels, and mice and chipmunks. So the odds are against them, but they seem to do very well. Along with flowers that bloom for only a few days or weeks, there are also a number of plants that begin blooming in June and continue for months, increasing in size or number as the weeks go by. In 2008, native Arizona thistles blossomed from at least June 21st through August 30th. Finally, starting sometime in the second half of summer, afternoon thunderstorms bring rain showers that can result in a great crescendo of life. Like everything else about the local climate, though, how much it rains can vary quite a bit. In July of 2008, we had 4.75 inches of rain, while only 1.9 inches fell in July of the next year. Summer storms can saturate the ground to the point of runoff. This storm was a big, noisy soaker with bouts of thunder, lightning, and hail. Often a break in the rain in late afternoon will bring us a rainbow, like it did today and eventually the sky is clear. At least 20 more species of wildflowers bloom in July and 25 more in August on larger, showerier plants than earlier in the year. Warm season grasses bloom too. Lots of penstemons bloom with the rains. Penstemons are the region's signature flowers because they're the largest genus of plants endemic to North America and they originated in the Intermountain West. This is their center of diversity. But the region is also known for its many showy members of the aster family, like this flea bane, and especially the yellow members of the family, such as goldenrod. It, the forest is alive at this time with lots of different insects. I have the impression that there are more of them flying around after the rains arrive, but I haven't recorded them systematically. Some flowers, like Rocky Mountain Beeweed, are not in the least particular about their pollinators. Here's a butterfly, bumblebees, and what I think is a taconid fly visit, visiting beeweed flowers on a gorgeous day in late July after the start of the rains. I used to think that insects were just fuzzy little bothers until I began to understand what they do for flowers. Now I think they're beautiful. Like some other members of its family, Lambert's local weed appears to change color after it is pollinated. It begins as a lavender flower, but then its banner, the fused petals on top that signal to pollinators, turn a beautiful shade of blue-green. Day flowers bloom for a short time early in August, and as their name suggests, each blooms for only a day. 
We tend to find them in patches of soil that are sandy and in grassy areas screened from the wind by the surrounding trees. Tufted evening primroses, which begin blooming as early as May, get a new lease on life with the rains and keep on blooming until August. Scarlet gillia is another one that keeps blooming and blooming of an ever elongating stem. Down in Big Canyon where it's cool and dim, it's a different world. Brickelia blooms here where it's very damp for weeks. Schoolers catch fly, flourishes in the rich and moist soil of the canyons also. It was difficult to put this program together because I had to leave out four-fifths of the plants and they're so beautiful. Of course, the rainy season is about more than flowers. We see, in, in, we see intriguing tracks in the mud at this time of year. Evidence of creatures that we would seldom have ever actually seen. And we're reminded that a lot of things happen in the forest on the warm summer nights. One day in late July, after the rains had started, Tom discovered this pair of nighthawk chicks in a forest opening. They're in the guild of ground nesters. Nighthawks used to nest on the gravel roofs of buildings in downtown Flagstaff, but the number of nighthawks in general has really dropped in recent decades. Can you see the two chicks that look like big pine cones? There they are. There's one of their parents keeping an eye on Tom from a neighboring tree. Male, male nighthawks are the ones that make that booming sound, that whooshing sound in the evenings, summer evenings. They're making a display dive. It's a nice time of year for the Abert squirrels. This is the best season for truffles. And the seeds in the pine cones are ripened. Before long, it's autumn with its mild days and lengthening nights. It's a time of delicate colors and shrubs and grasses. There's a fresh, sharp scent in the air in places where leaves are dropping and decomposing, like the north side of Fay Canyon and the Aspen Grove down in Scum. Although once again we may have frost in the mornings, I think of autumn as a gentle season, when the thunderstorms of late summer have eased up but the days are still warm. Shrubs bear the seeds and fruits that nourish birds, squirrels, and even coyotes, snowberries, sumac berries, wild rose hips, and creeping barberries. Bull elk bugle in the evenings, the rabbit brush deepens in color and begins to dry out. The grasses change color too. The little blue stem turns a rusty lavender, as you can see by the clump on the right. There's still so much to marvel over in the forest before the snows come again. I think we'd all agree that it's wonderful to have the Ponderosa Forest all around and even within the city of Flagstaff. And now is a fascinating time to be here because so much research about the forest is going on. We learn more every day about how dynamic and ever-changing it is, how complex it is with its overlapping systems, influences, and responses. It's so much more than trees. Embracing science for how it enhances our natural sense of wonder is an idea that the American deep ecologist Thomas Berry suggested over 20 years in the Sierra Club book called The Dream of the Earth. He wrote, a new intimacy with the universe has begun within the context of our scientific tradition. The very intensity of our inquiry into the structure and functioning of the natural world reveals an entrancement with the natural world. What we're learning beyond a doubt is that everything on Earth is inextricably interconnected. We humans have always had an intense interest in nature when it hasn't been eclipsed by busyness and distraction. This nesting box Tom found in the forest is not on any road or trail. We don't know who put it there or why. It could be a Forest Service project or a scientific experiment, or just an offering by someone who loves birds. Because there have always been people in every culture and tradition who felt a kinship with nature through observation, intuition, and intimacy, we've always expressed this through this love of nature, through painting and poetry, music, and even gardens. One of my favorite examples of this, I was warned not to play this, uh, is a song in praise of nature that was composed over 800 years ago by the Rhineland mystic Hildegard of Bingen. 
Whenever I listen to it, this music stays with me for days, especially